Hello there and welcome to this revision section which is on EQ1 of the tectonic processes and hazards topic. So EQ1 says why are some locations more at risk from tectonic hazards and that's the aim of the next 30 minutes or so of this session. A reminder to use the booklet that you've been given along with this session to help you review EQ1 and a reminder that this is not detailed enough to replace all of the lesson learning you've done. This is just an overview of the EQs in this topic. One thing to say before we move on is that you've also got to remember that tectonics and, pro and hazards as a topic overall is actually only worth 16 marks of your entire A-level course. A very, very large topic to learn, but actually you're not asked a lot on it. It's one of the smallest sections. So you need to just have a good overview of knowledge of this topic so that you can apply and choose some different case studies that you might use for the questions that you might be asked. So the first part of EQ1 is looking at where the volcanoes, earthquakes and tsunamis happen in the world. And to start with that, we need to know what a tectonic hazard is. So a tectonic hazard is anything that threats human life or infrastructure because of the processes of plate boundaries and the movement of them. And so we've got a number of general facts about the distribution and general key terms to understand. So it's useful to remember that most earthquakes occur on or at plate boundaries and the most powerful ones are at conservative plate boundaries. The Ocean Fracture Zone, or OFZ for short, is earthquake activity along mid-ocean ridges. So, for example, in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we, that is the Ocean Fraction Zone, and we have smaller earthquake activity along there. And then we also have a Continental Fracture Zone, or a CFZ, and that's earthquake activity along mountain ranges. The Pacific Ring of Fire, which is famous for being a ring of fire, a ring of volcanoes and earthquakes around the Pacific Ocean, is a very active area tectonically for those volcanoes and earthquakes. But earthquakes can also occur intraplate, which is inside the plate boundaries, so not on the margins themselves. And volcanoes occur in constructive and destructive margins where there is an opportunity for magma to rise from the mantle. So just a bit more detail on some of those. The intraplate earthquakes that were mentioned earlier, these are earthquakes, as we said, that occur inside the plate margins. And that's because of the stresses and pressures that the rock deep under Earth goes through during the movement of the plate boundary. So it doesn't always have to be on the plate margins. And these earthquakes are usually weaker earthquakes because there is no margin involved. But these earthquakes can happen in places like the UK. And the UK gets lots and lots of earthquakes each year that are so small we don't actually notice them at all. We also have something else that's intraplate, and that is volcanic hotspots. And these are essentially inside the plate boundary as well and they happen because of a fracture in the crust where there's a magma plume a chamber of magma underneath that's rising through the crust and this is what's actually created islands such as hawaii and iceland over time remember with this the magma plume itself the magma chamber underneath the crust doesn't move but the plates still move and that's why hawaii for example is in an island arc so is the philippines it's because the actual plates above it still move they move the land with it but magma plume itself stays stationary now we're going to go through the margins really briefly and just have a brief outline of what each margin looks like so we're going to start with constructive margins now constructive margins as you can see from the diagram here move apart allowing a volcano to come up through the center of that movement like a mid-ocean ridge two types so you can have oceanic and oceanic plates moving apart or you can have continental and continental plates so when oceanic and oceanic move apart 
we get magma rising to the surface. They're normally basilitic, um, which means they're from basalt. Um, normally they're quite small, they're quite gentle, they don't cause um, severe damage normally. Whereas continental and continental um, constructive plates again move apart and these cause again small earthquakes and also small volcanoes. Key thing to remember is that the mantle convection, the convection currents in the mantle cause the plates to move apart. A crack or a fracture zone opens up. That might be an ocean fracture zone or a continental fracture zone. And the eruptions are usually effusive, which means that they're usually not damaging. They're usually quite gentle and small. And there is a low gas content. There's no real gas that comes out of these volcanoes, but there is a high viscosity of the magma. We then got destructive margins. Now, destructive margins can come in three forms. It can be, again, oceanic, oceanic, or continental, continental, but it can also be oceanic and continental. And oceanic and continental is the one you probably know most about, and that's what's shown here in the diagram on the right. So an oceanic plate is subducted under the continental plate. And the reason for that is because the oceanic plate is more dense, it's heavier, so it is subducted underneath the continental plate. This forms mountain ranges, it forms large earthquakes and violent eruptions of volcanoes. So this is the most dangerous type of plate for all types of different hazards that are tectonic. So again, it's the mantle convection that holds the plates towards each other, creates the subduction zone. The denser plate, which is the oceanic plate, subducts and that leads to friction and melting happening of that oceanic plate as you can see in the diagram here that's what creates our magma for our volcano as well but we also have as i mentioned earlier oceanic to oceanic margins and one of these will be subducted under the other depending on which is more dense that generates frequent earthquakes. It can also create a chain of volcanic islands like in Alaska there. But we also have, as we mentioned, continental to continental. And when you have the two continental land masses colliding, that creates our fold mountain belts. Eruptions are possible here, but as the magma cools and solidifies beneath the surface, they are rare. So eruptions are possible and we get infrequent major earthquakes at these continental to continental plate boundaries. And then we have conservative margins. These ones are the simplest of all of the margins. This is when you have two plates moving side by side, as you can see in this diagram. Now they can be moving in the same direction as they are in this diagram, or they can move in opposite directions and they move at different speeds. A great example of this is the San Andreas Fault Line, which is a 1200 kilometer fault line along the coast of California. These are only oceanic and continental. Okay, so they don't have two oceanic or two continental. So they are only oceanic and continental plate boundaries. So the plates slide past each other. There's frequent earthquakes. Some of them are very large and very destructive. The focal depth where the focus is, is usually quite shallow, so not very deep. And there is no volcanic activity created at a conservative mark. And to understand convection currents and to understand why this all happens, we need to talk about the Earth's structure. So you can see a diagram on the right hand side here of the Earth structure that you would have used in lessons. The Earth structure is made up of a number of different layers. So we've got starting from the crust. The crust is around zero to 100 kilometers thick, and that's our continental and oceanic layer. That is the part of the world we live on. We've then got the lithosphere just underneath that. And that's in the upper crust and the upper part of the mantle. And we've then got the asthenosphere, which as you can see in the diagram is actually in the mantle. And this is where we have the convection currents. So 
in the asthenosphere is where the convection currents happen and that pushes the plates apart towards each other and side by side. We then have the mantle, which is the molten rock layer with high temperatures and a slow flow. So there is a slow moving process of convection currents taking place in the mantle. We then have the outer core and that liquid, and it's made up of iron and nickel. And we've got the inner core as well, which is solid and made up of irons and nickels. And it's about six and a half thousand kilometers to get to the very center of the core. Now, mantle convection or convection currents are essentially what makes the plates of the world move. Well, these are what generates the heat. This is what actually puts pressure on the crust to make that all of the different parts of the crust, like the jigsaw, move around the earth. And this is what happens to create our very dangerous in some cases plate boundary tectonic events so we have the constructive destructive and conservative margins moving as a result of these convection points essentially it's the internal heat engine of the world and we must consider some of the key discoveries and frameworks or knowledge theory in which we have prove and to back up the ideas of plate boundaries and how earthquakes, volcanoes and tsunamis happen. We've got a number of key discoveries first. So the Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift from 1912 is a theory that says all of the continents were actually one large supercontinent called Pangaea. But today they have moved apart because of these convection problems. We've also got the idea of convection currents by Arthur Holmes in the 1930s. Said the mantle convection was the driving force, and that's what moved tectonic plates. We've also got Harry Hess in the 1960s, who created the theory of plate spreading, seafloor spreading, and mid-ocean ridges being created. And we've also got the paleomagnetism theory. And the paleomagnetism theory is about the Earth's magnetic field of the North and South Pole and how that creates patterns on the world's sea floors when the sea floor spread to show that magnetism exists and to show that the sea floor does spread over time. And so we've also got then the three ideas of subduction, gravitational sliding and slab pull. So the idea of subduction has been mentioned already, whereby one plate, which is more dense and heavy, subducts or sinks on the, the lighter continental plate, usually. These create earthquakes. And usually the depths of those earthquakes are between 10 and 400 kilometers on the subduction. And they occur at destructive margins mainly where the oceanic plate subducts on. We've then got the idea of gravitational sliding. Now, gravitational sliding occurs at constructive margins that move apart. And so rising heat from the magma under those constructive margins creates a slight slope between those plates. And that is where we have naturally the slide of the plates. So there is a gap that opens up between those two plates. And finally, we've got slab pull. This is where we have co the cold, dense oceanic plate, which subducts underneath the continental plate. And the density of the oceanic plate pulls itself into the mantle. So this is about the continental plate being lighter, so it stays above floating on the convection currents, whereas the oceanic plate, which is much heavier, more dense, colder, and it, sub it subducts itself into the mantle, it's pulled into the mantle, and that is what's known as slab pull. Okay, so a roundup then 
of the plate boundaries, the activities that occur there, the types of hazards, and an example of each of them. So let's take them all individually. That a constructive plate margin. These are the ones that move apart. We generally get shallow volcanoes, sorry, earthquakes, that are less than 60 kilometers deep. And we generally also get low magnitude ones, so they're under five magnitude in strength, which means that actually they're not very damaging, these types of earthquakes. The volcanoes at a constructive margin are generally also small, low. They have a very low gas content, so they're not explosive and they have high viscosity. And an example of a constructive margin there is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Mid-Ocean Ridge between the Eurasian and North American plate boundaries. So the next one is a destructive margin, and this time it's oceanic and continental, okay? So ocean and continent. Now these plates move towards each other, and these create very large earthquakes. They can be up to nine magnitude on the Richter scale. As we seen earlier, we get a friction zone and pressure building up along where the oceanic plates subduct under the continental plate. In terms of volcanoes, we get frequent and violent eruptions from these. They're usually composite volcanoes, so they're the tall mountainous volcanoes. And usually they're quite explosive because of the high gas and silica content within the magma. An example of this is the Nazca and South American plate boundary, and that created the Chile 2010 earthquake. Another destructive margin to think about is an oceanic and oceanic one. So this is where two oceanic plates are moving towards each other. And these create frequent earthquakes, but they're not as large as the oceanic and continental destructive plate margins. They're not as large as those. We also get violent eruptions of volcanoes from an oceanic and oceanic plate margin going towards each other. And it also creates a curve of volcanic islands such as Hawaii. And we can use, for example, a 2018 Hawaii earthquake and Mauna Loa of 1984 eruption as examples of these oceanic and oceanic destructive margins. We then have a collisional plate margin, which is continent and continent. Remember, collisional plate margins are destructive margins, but we can give them the name collision. This is where two continents move towards each other. This generally creates large fault lines, which are quite shallow, and we have high magnitude earthquakes from these. These plate boundaries do not have volcanic eruptions. So these two land masses do not create volcanic eruptions, just earthquakes. The Andes in South America is a great example of a continent and continent collision boundary. And it has had a recent earthquake of 4.9 magnitude in 24. And finally, we have our conservative margins. Now remember, conservative margins slide to side by each other in the same direction or in opposite directions. And these create the largest types of earthquakes. So we get high magnitude earthquakes. We have a very shallow focal depth. So the focus is not very deep and they are very destructive to, very destructive to the environment and to buildings, etc. We do not get any volcanic eruptions at a conservative plate margin. And an example of these would be the Pacific and North American plates which create the San Andreas Fault. And in 1989, we had a near seven magnitude earthquake there. And there is another one due anytime soon. So now we need to look at the hazards that earthquakes actually create. So the earthquake is the hazard itself, but that creates secondary hazards as well, okay? So what really creates the hazards and what really makes earthquakes so dangerous are the seismic waves that they create. So there are a number of types of waves. First of all, there are primary waves or P waves. Now these are the fastest types of seismic waves. They cause the least damage or the least destructive because they have less energy. And they basically cause land to compress because of the vibrations they emit. 
they usually come first because they're the fastest type. Then when we have an earthquake event, we have secondary waves or S waves, and these, these arrive straight after the P waves. And these shake the ground violently, and these are the ones that cause damage on the landscape. So they travel slightly slower than P waves. And finally, we have L waves or love waves. Now, these arrive last, they travel the slowest, and they only travel horizontally on the surface of the Earth. But they cause significant damage, including what's called crustal fracturing, which is the fracture of the crust. So these travel horizontally, they cause significant damage, as do S waves, and they cause visible scarring to the crust on the landscape. So let's go through some of the hazards that earthquakes cause. And we've just mentioned crustal fracturing, and this is a primary hazard from the earthquake. So this happens because of the earthquake itself immediately. So what we see is a buckling or fracturing of the Earth's surface, cracks developing in the Earth's surface. And this is happens particularly at large earthquake zones, such as in the Indian Ocean in 2004, which was one of your case studies. And that created a 1,000 kilometer fault line underneath the Indian Ocean. So a very large crustal fracturing that took place there. We can also have liquefaction, which is a secondary hazard to the earthquake. So this happens after the P and S waves and L waves take place. And it happens where there may be a waterlogged ground surface. And what happens is the earthquake waves loosened the soil under the ground surface and it causes the water to rise on the surface and comes through the cracks that have been created by crustal fracturing. And this causes significant damage to foundations of buildings. It causes buildings to sink or subside and tilt and they can often collapse too. And finally, another secondary hazard that earthquakes can create are landslides. Remember, earthquakes loosen the soil. Okay? Because of those P, S and L waves, the soil loosen, loosens and dislodges. So the geology is affected of a particular area. And on mountain and hillsides, that causes the sediment to become loose and to fall downhill. And a good example of this was your Sichuan 2008 case study where 30% of all of the deaths in that earthquake event were actually caused by the secondary landslide. We're going to look at the same again now. So the hazards caused by this time volcanoes and volcanic activity. We've got a number of them here and I've separated them into P or S, P for primary and S for secondary. And I'm just going to go through a list of what each of them are. First of all, we have pyroclastic flow. This is a primary hazard. And these are very large, dense, hot and ash and gas clouds with temperatures of up to 600 degrees that flow down the side of a mountain or hillside very, very fast. They can be 350 or 400 miles per hour in speed. These are very destructive. And they're caused by the buildup of the pressure of gas and ash. Another primary hazard created by volcanoes is ashfall itself. So this is where ash particles, which are thrown into the air, fall back down onto the landscape. And they can kill vegetation. They can collapse buildings over time if there's, if there's enough ash and there's enough weight for it. They poison water sources. And that's another way in which volcanoes create a primary hazard. Another primary hazard is the lava flow from an earthquake of a volcano itself. So what we can get is extensive areas covered by lava flow. The lava can solidify as well and create rock. So these lava flows can extend for several kilometers. It can flow up to 40 kilometers an hour. And of course, it destroys. It's very destructive. So it destroys anything within its path. And the final primary 
hazard caused by an earth a volcano is gas eruptions. So the gases that are released into the atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide, etc., poise can poison people and get into their lungs and poison people. Also, animals in extreme cases as well. So this can be very dangerous for human life. And of course, remember, there is also the case that over time, this can lead to climate change and adds to the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as well. So we've got two secondary hazards caused by volcanoes. The first one is lahars. Now, lahars are very simply volcanic mud flows. Okay, so a lot like landslides, only that they're volcanic. So rainfall can actually mobilize the volcanic ash that's fallen and settled. If the volcanic ash becomes very wet, it becomes like a mud-like consistency, and that can flow down the side of a mountainside at high speed into river systems towards towns and cities and create major destruction, just like flooding would. And then we have finally jockalopes. Now, these are also secondary hazards caused by volcanoes. And they are essentially flooding that's caused by a volcanic eruption beneath a glacier or an ice cap, melting that glacier, creating huge volumes of meltwater. And a good example of this is in Iceland on the Katla or Eyjafjallajökull um, volcanoes, where there is ice formed on the tops of those volcanoes on the craters. And back in 2010 in Iceland, for example, caused major flooding problems to the rural communities of Iceland. So they are all of the hazards created by a volcanic eruption, both primary and secondary hazards. One of the final things to look at here then is tsunamis and what causes tsunamis and what are their characteristics. So tsunamis can be generated by a number of things. They can be generated by what are called submarine earthquakes at subduction zones. So they are earthquakes under the ocean. But they can also be caused by volcanic eruptions on volcanic islands and also landslides. Now, the most common types of tsunamis are caused by submarine earthquakes. Okay. So what happens is if you have a submarine earthquake or an earthquake under the sea, that disrupts the seabed rock. So it jolts the movement of rock underneath the sea. It's a violent movement, which then usually has a domino effect. If you think about bath water or a lake, if you throw a rock into it, that removes all of the water violently to the surrounding areas. Okay, So you see that ripple effect. And that is exactly what a tsunami is. This basically creates a distinctive kind of bulge of water. That's moving towards coastlines. They're actually quite hard to see out at sea in the open ocean because what happens is as they move towards the shore, they slow dramatically. The wave length drops, but the actual height of the wave increases because it can't go downwards. If you're going towards the shore, the sea is getting shallower, so it has to move upwards. It has to go somewhere, so it moves upwards. And really what you generally see is wave heights typically less than one meters out at sea, but it can rise then as it moves towards the coast. But the speeds can, between, can be between 250 kilometers an hour and 950 kilometers an hour. So they are very fast moving ocean waves. This all causes shorelines to be damaged, flooded, and it can lead to severe secondary consequences of an earthquake and then a tsunami as well. So that was the key one of the tectonic processes and hazards topic. Hopefully you found that useful just as a roundup and overview of what was in EQ1 of the topic and why tectonic hazards 
are so dangerous and how they develop. The next jog pod, the next se section of this will be on EQ2. I hope you found this useful. And make sure you watch EQ2 as well.